Welcome, alumni, to the first ever Fuqua Faculty Conversations. My name is Shane DeCauley. I'm an Associate Professor in Accounting at the Fuqua School. One of the most common questions I get asked outside of the classroom is what do you do when you're not teaching? And one of the objectives of today's webinar is to provide some insight into what faculty do outside of the classroom. The topic of today's webinar is the effects of CEO traits, the economic effects, and in particular, one type of CEO trait is CEO integrity, which is a trait I'm very interested in because of a research project I'm currently working on. I'm working on that project with a PhD student, Thomas Steffen, as well as a colleague of mine in accounting, his name's Professor Bill Mayhew. Two important messages that we are trying to convey out of this study are the following, that academic researchers are starting to measure the CEO traits using proxies from publicly available data. And secondly, the researchers are finding relations between these proxies and some economic consequences related to firm policies and financial outcomes of firms. There are three questions of interest for today's webinar. Firstly, do CEO traits in general have economic consequences, such as changes in corporate policy, investment policies, and also financial outcomes? Secondly, what are academic researchers interested in when they measure CEO traits? And then thirdly, the more specific question of, does CEO integrity have economic consequences? And I'll look at all three of those throughout this webinar today. First question of interest is a general one. It's, do CEO traits in general matter? Significant interest in this topic was raised back in 2003 in a paper by Bertrand and Shaw. They investigate whether the style of managers has any difference or makes any difference to corporate policy and investment policy choices as well as financial outcomes of firms. One of the unique things that Bertrand and Shaw did was to try and disentangle the effect of firm and managerial effects and the way they did that was to track a database of executives and managers who switched firms and they were able to isolate the effects of the manager versus the firm. At a conceptual level, Bertrand and Shaw ask the following question. Do unobserved managerial traits have any effect on financial outcomes, financial policies, firm strategy, and investment policies? What they do to proxy for unobserved managerial traits is to use managerial switches. And the idea there is that if style does matter, then it should translate into fixed effects associated with these switches, and then that in turn will be associated with corporate outcomes. Bertrand and Shaw measure financial outcomes such as return on assets, investment policy such as the number of acquisitions, financial policy such as leverage, and firm strategy such as the number of diversifying acquisitions. And they also include a number of controls which represent other economic explanations for why we might see these financial outcomes occur. And their idea is that if style does matter, it should have an effect over and above these controls in predicting the economic outcomes. They applied their tests to a sample of 500 managerial switches between 1969 and 1999 in the Forbes 800. There's three key findings in the Bertrand and Shaw paper. Firstly, that managerial fixed effects such as style really do matter, in particular for corporate policy decisions and firm strategy decisions. Secondly, the effect is four percentage points on performance outcomes, and thirdly, the effects are especially important in acquisition and diversification type activities as well as dividend policy and cost cutting policies. There have been many extensions of the Bertrand and Shaw results into the accounting literature. So for example, there have been studies that have looked at 
whether unobserved managerial traits affect corporate governance, financial reporting, tax avoidance and financial reporting quality. One of my colleagues here at Fuqua, Scott Dyring, has specifically worked on the study that looks at whether managerial traits affect tax avoidance. In our study, we examine whether CEOs and CFOs have an individual effect on the firm's uh, corporate tax avoidance. And the question was interesting because many people believe that a CEO or a CFO would not know the minute details required to uh, engage in uh, corporate tax avoidance. So we uh, ran a fairly sophisticated statistical model where we examined the corporate effective tax rate of firms where a new CFO or a new CEO had been hired and found that certain CFOs and CEOs uh, were able to reduce their corporate tax rates substantially depending on the style with which they manage. Another important study was conducted here at Fuqua by John Graham and two of his PhD students, which has recently been published. The general question is, do unobserved managerial traits have an effect on compensation? In turn, they were interested in whether these managerial traits was a signal of managerial ability, which in turn affected future firm outcomes. Three key findings from the Graham, Lee and Key paper are the following. Firstly, managerial fixed effects do matter in explaining variations in executive pay. They find that these effects hold over and above all the other economic explanations for why compensation levels are what they are. Secondly, they find that firm performance improves after CEOs with larger compensation related style effects are hired. This suggests that these style effects are related to innate managerial ability. And then finally, they find that overpaid managers tend to use less debt. In a study conducted in part here at Fuqua, my colleague Bill Mayhew and I have worked with DJ Nanda from the University of Miami and measured the length of time that a CEO has been at the helm of a firm. We use this measure as a proxy for the uncertainty that a board of directors has about the CEO's ability. The longer that a CEO has been with a firm, then the less uncertainty that a board of directors has about the CEO's ability. There are two key findings from the Dicoli, Mayu and Nanda paper. Firstly, that uncertainty about ability will affect the reliance on performance measures. The more uncertain that the board is about the CEO's ability, the more that they rely on performance measures. And we find that that is particularly the case in turnover decisions. Secondly, we find that uncertainty about ability will also affect governance choices. And in particular, the longer that a CEO has been with the firm, the more certain that a board of directors is about that CEO's ability. And we find that uh, the CEO will negotiate away governance constraints. And what we take away from these two findings is the following, that if you're a relatively inexperienced manager, then be careful of performance measures. They really matter more. So far we've talked about the measurement of CEO traits in general, as if they're in a black box. What we plan to do in the second part of this webinar is to look more specifically at what's in the black box. So what do we mean by specific managerial traits? Now the second question of interest in this webinar is what are the CEO traits that academic researchers are measuring? There's been a number of recent academic studies that look at CEO traits and I classify them into two categories, easy to measure and difficult to measure. There are five easy to measure CEO traits. Firstly, tenure or experience with the firm, which we've talked about. Secondly, the MBA graduation. So do CEOs with MBAs make different decisions to CEOs who don't have MBAs? Third, the birth year of the CEO. Are older CEOs more conservative than other CEOs? Fourth, we look at religion. Do Protestants make different investment decisions to Catholics? Is an example of a prior research study. And then finally, 
honours and awards, do award-winning CEOs make different decisions that lead to an underperformance in subsequent periods to winning the award? There are four difficult to measure CEO traits. The first one is innate ability. And there are many recent examples of studies that try to get at innate ability. One of the ones was done here at Fuqua by Jennifer Francis, uh, Alan Huang, Shiva Rajkapal and Amy Zhang. And they use press citations as a proxy for CEO innate ability. The idea is that the more expert that a CEO is perceived to be, then the more likely they're going to be cited in the press. What we found uh, was that CEOs who were what we call more reputed, so therefore had more press releases written about them, those CEOs tended to be associated with firms that had poorer earnings quality. So the net result was better reputation, poor quality. Now obviously there's, there's at least two explanations for this. One explanation is better CEOs create poor earnings quality, potentially by engaging in earnings management type activities. That's kind of a causal explanation. The other explanation is that firms that have poor earnings quality, perhaps because of just the industry models, the business models, the environment they're operating in, they need a more reputed, they need a better CEO in order to handle that environment. So we ran some additional tasks to try to disentangle which of those two effects was going on. The first one you might call sort of rent extraction. The second one is more of a matching type argument. Our additional tasks unequivocally suggest that matching is what's happening here. So what we're finding is that the firms that really are in environments that would create poor earnings quality seek to hire CEOs that are more reputed or have better reputations in that regard. The second type of innate ability measure comes from frontier analysis, which was done also in a recent study. And the idea there is that uh, firms' efficient benchmarks are measured using frontier analysis and any deviations away from that benchmark are deemed to be C CEO innate ability. The second type of difficult to measure CEO traits are physical traits. And we're going to look at two types. Firstly, facial traits. Puri, Graham and Harvey find three things in their study. They asked 2,000 subjects to rate the facial characteristics of CEOs. And the first thing they find is that large firm CEOs are more are perceived to be more competent looking and less likable than small firm CEOs. We all have the notion that looks matter, certainly in our personal life, but do looks matter in the professional life, you know, especially in the corporate sector where most of us work. So we study CEOs who are arguably at the very top of the corporate ladder and ask, do the looks of CEOs matter? And so the way we do this experiment is we take photographs of CEOs and we pair them with other people who are not CEOs. We sort of match them so they have similar hair, you know, in a suit, et cetera. And we do a web-based experiment in which we ask people to rate these pairs of photographs on competent looks, beauty, uh, trustworthiness and likability. And what we find is that CEOs just look a lot more competent. And when we compare uh, CEOs of large companies with CEOs of small companies, we find the CEOs of large companies look more competent than the CEOs of small companies. And then we ask, well, how does this translate into compensation? Uh, and what we find, interestingly enough, is that if you're a CEO who looks more competent, you actually are paid more. And so this raises the question, is it that you look competent and you actually are more competent? And so we examine the performance of these companies and we find no evidence that CEOs who look more competent actually have better performance in terms of you know, better profitability of their companies. So the important takeaway from that paper is that the look of competence doesn't necessarily equate to effective competence. Second type of physical tra trait is voice pitch. And we have two researchers in accounting here at Fuqua that have looked at voice pitch in quite some detail. The first is Mohan Venkatachalam, who looks at the effect of voice pitch in capital markets. The main message of our research was that when CEOs and CFOs talk in earnings conference calls, you listen. 
In particular, you want to focus on how they sound. You want to focus on their vocal tone so that it can help you determine whether you want to buy or sell the stock. It, it also helps us understand whether there is some fraudulent reporting and perhaps identify financial shenanigans. An interesting question that comes out of the voice pitch research is, can voices be trained? Mohan's co-author, Bill Mayhew at Fuqua, explains. I think there's some belief in the market that certain aspects of your voice can be trained. For example, there are CEO consulting firms that will help a CEO, for example, develop a deeper voice pitch. Um, you know, the extent to which you can change the innate voice of an individual is somewhat limited, though. Um, and I think for our research, we were trying to measure voice characteristics that evoke emotions. And there's a lot of literature that suggests that emotions are very hard to mask. And so to the extent that a CEO, for example, could mask the emotion in their voice um, is difficult. Our research suggests that there is some emotion coming through. Uh, the extent to which CEOs are successful at masking uh, their emotions, uh, we can't really speak to it, but it's possible. The third category of difficult to measure CEO traits are cognitive biases. There are many examples. Two of them include optimism and overconfidence. Firstly, optimism. A recent study done by David Robinson and Manju Puri at the Fuqua School looks at a very simple measure of optimism and how it relates to economic choices. So they look at optimism in terms of how far away people's own predictions about their life expectancy is from life expectancy tables. The survey of consumer finance asked people how long they expect to live. And it also asks them a lot of other questions that allow you to sort of back out um, from actuarial tables how long you might expect them to live statistically. So for example, I know whether you smoke, I know whether you're married, I know your education. And these are all factors that people have shown uh, affect life expectancy. So what we did is we created a measure of optimism that just compared simply your subjective measure of how long you expected to live with your statistical or objective measure. And that difference turns out to be uh, an interesting and pretty persuasive way to capture optimism. People who with you know, big deviations are optimists. People who are right on track are sort of neither optimistic nor pessimistic. And people who are way, well under the statistical number would be pessimist. With respect to overconfidence, we see a lot of studies looking at a measure of overconfidence based on the choices that executives make with respect to stock option uh, vesting. The fourth and final category of difficult to measure attributes are related to innate preferences. And what I mean by innate preferences are things like risk avoidance, group norm conformity, and in fact there's been a paper done in the Netherlands that looks at whether those two types of innate preferences are linked to the choices that CEOs make with respect to control system design. And then Another example of innate preferences are the major topic of the study that I'm interested in, which is integrity. And we'll look at integrity in more detail in the third part of this webinar. In this third part of the webinar, we look at one specific CEO trait, which is integrity. And we're particularly interested in whether integrity might have an effect on earnings quality. And this is a study I've worked on with a PhD student, Thomas Steffen, as well as Bill Mayhew, my colleague in accounting. There are three aspects to this study. Firstly, how do we measure integrity? Secondly, why is it important to study CEO integrity? And third, how do we execute a study based on CEO integrity, and in particular, how it relates to earnings quality? When we define integrity, we use a definition that was developed by Michael Jensen who's a vocal commentator about CEO integrity in the business world. His definition of integrity relates to honoring one's word. And his definition is, an individual is whole and complete when their word is whole and complete. And their word is whole and complete when they honor their word. We take two dimensions of this definition. First, that the CEO does what he or she says that he or she will do. And secondly, that the CEO will correct the situation when they can't honour their word. Why is it important to study integrity? 
In a recent survey by IBM of 1,500 CEOs across 60 different countries and 33 different industries, they found that CEOs themselves felt that integrity was the second most important quality, leadership quality in fact, that a CEO should have over the next five years. It was second behind creativity and there was a steep drop to the third placed global thinking. The other interesting dimension to this study was the fact that CEOs felt it important to say that integrity was an important characteristic and even if they didn't believe it, it was important enough to say because they believe that the market demands integrity. So how do we design a study that's based on CEO integrity? We have a definition of integrity which is based on honouring one's word and we also know that integrity is really important to CEOs. So we start with the idea that uh, firms do not make decisions, people make decisions. We also know from what we've learnt today so far uh, that traits matter in choices with respect to policies as well as uh, accounting choices and financial reporting choices. And so if that's the case and integrity is a trait that matters, then we should be able to see a relation between integrity and financial accounting choices or financial reporting choices. And so our study looks at whether CEO integrity, assuming we can measure it, affects accounting choices. The idea for this study came from a PhD student at Duke. His name is Thomas Steffen. He was studying for a course in empirical research in financial accounting with Catherine Shipper and one of the assigned tasks was to develop a research project. I got interested in integrity for two main reasons. First, I think it's important to remember that people matter. In the business press and in the media, we read stories about companies and firms, but we need to remember that there are people actually making those decisions that result in those stories that we read about or result in that information that we observe. Second, I think of all the characteristics we could study about people about CEOs and their firms integrity is one of the most important. In some recent work Erhard, Jensen and Zafron have argued that without integrity nothing works. That basically means that if you have integrity you're maximizing your opportunity to succeed. That when there's trust, when people can rely on, on each other's words that they're able to give themselves the best chance to succeed and so I thought it was something that would have far-reaching effects um, in CEOs firms and their companies and that's the reason I got interested in it. Here's an overview of the study. At a conceptual level, we're interested in the question of whether CEO integrity affects financial reporting outcomes. The way that financial reporting outcomes is typically measured in the academic literature is by way of discretionary earnings quality. And the link between CEO integrity and discretionary earnings quality in this study at a conceptual level is labelled A. Discretionary earnings quality is essentially earnings quality that is determined by managerial choices. So it's completely up to management how they want to convey information, so to speak, to the market, as opposed to earnings quality that is determined by what I would consider innate characteristics of the business. At a operational level, we measure CEO integrity in a new and unique way. We actually count the number of causation words that are in shareholder letters. And as I'll explain in a few moments, causation words are linked to the way that integrity might be considered to be honouring one's word. We measure the discretionary earnings quality by way of e-loading and that's a, a standard measure that's used in the literature. And then finally, we have to control for a number of other variables uh, which have been shown in the past to affect e-loading. What we want to do is to be able to show that CEO integrity affects discretionary earnings quality and specifically e-loading over and above all the other economic forces that affect e-loading. One of the most important links in this study is the link between the conceptual measure of CEO integrity and the operational measure, which is uh, the number of causation words. And we label that link B. 
And then link C is the effect of controls on e-loading. And so we're going to look at A, B and C in turn. Now we drill down into link A, which is the link between CEO integrity and discretionary earnings quality. And to explain how integrity might conceptually link to discretionary earnings quality, Bill Mayhew, one of the co-authors on this study, explains. When you think about the concept of integrity in accounting or financial reporting, um, you've got to think of a way to measure and think about how could you identify if CEOs are generating financial reports with integrity, um, underpinning the financial numbers. And one way to think about that is integrity is a notion of honoring one's word. Uh, in accounting, how we think about uh, the words that CEOs speak in numbers uh, are accruals, and accruals are placeholders for cash flows. And so what you might think about um, operationalizing or thinking about how to measure integrity is to figure out whether an accrual maps into or turns into a cash flow in the future. And so in research, what we're trying to do is measure integrity as is the word of the CEO in terms of the accrual number actually representative of the future cash that will come into the firm. Now we look to link B, which is getting an operational measure of CEO integrity. The source for measuring CEO integrity is shareholder letters. And these shareholder letters are a statement that are written by CEOs at the end of every fiscal period. Now the reason why we thought that shareholder letters would be a useful source to pick up indications of CEO integrity is because they're less regulated than say the 10K reports or the MD&A and 10K reports. Uh, secondly, they are a personal statement by the CEO and thirdly, they tend to focus on firm performance. So we figured that if we could capture some words out of that shareholder letter statement, we could be able to develop a reasonable measure of CEO integrity. So once we have shareholder letters, we have to be able to measure integrity in some way. So what we did was to take the shareholder letters and count the number of causation words, for example, because, effect, hence, and words like that. And those words are linked to excuses. And excuses in prior work has been shown to be a threat to integrity. So we count the number of causation words and then we link the number of causation words to an assumption about integrity. So the high number of causation words means that there's going to be low levels of integrity. So once we have our measure of causation words, we have to convince people that this truly is a measure of integrity. The way that we tried to validate our measure was to access another unique database which we were able to access from KRW International. Now KRW International is a consulting firm that undertake an ongoing research project that tries to capture CEO beliefs. Now by capturing CEO beliefs they're looking at things like integrity, responsibility, forgiveness, compassion and they do this through a number of survey questions. Uh, that they ask the CEO, more than 150 survey questions in fact. And not only do they ask the CEOs these questions, but they also ask approximately 20 to 30 of the CEO's closest uh, working employees the same questions. And the project then looks at the discrepancy between what the employees think of the CEO and what the CEO thinks of themselves. So we were able to isolate out the measures with respect to integrity. And that gave us a starting point for being able to evaluate uh, the validity of our measure of causation words. So once we've got these measures of the discrepancies between what the CEOs thought and what the employees thought of the CEOs integrity, and we did this on 10 different integrity questions and took an average score, we correlated that with a causation score. And that causation score was based on 24 open-ended questions where we counted the number of cause-related words and then we got a causation score and correlated that with our discrepancy score on, on integrity. And 
if they were correlated, positively correlated and statistically significantly so, then that provides some assurance to us that what we're actually capturing is related to integrity. It turns out that the correlation is 0.3599 and positive and statistically significant. To give a flavour of some of the integrity type questions in the KRW survey, uh, here's some examples. First, if I agree to do something, I typically follow through. Second, I will confront someone if I see them do something unethical. And third, when someone asks me to keep a confidence, I do. And so for questions like this, and in fact there were 10 of them, uh, the CEOs and the employees were asked to rank from on a scale of one to nine. Nine being the highest agreement, one being the least agreement. Then once we had these uh, scores, we were able to average them and get a net integrity score for the CEO, for the employees, the difference was the discrepancy. I asked Thomas Steffen, how important was it that we had this survey data? The KRW international data were critical to carrying out the study. The reason is because measuring a trait like integrity is very difficult and we can't observe it. The KRW data allowed us to take some concrete evidence about the integrity of certain CEOs and link that with the measure that we're proposing. And getting comfortable with that measure was very important. Once we were able to do that with the KRW data, we were able to go sample a large number of CEOs with the measure that we propose. So going back to our diagram, what we did here was to validate the link between CEO integrity and the number of causation words. And so that was step B or link B on the diagram. What we wanted to do next after validating link B was to uh, show the link between the causation words and a measure of earnings quality, uh, which is e-loading, controlling for all of the other economic determinants that affect e-loading. So what is e-loading? I asked Frank Ecker, who's a Fuqua faculty member, to explain. Frank worked on a study with Irene Kim and three Fuqua faculty members, Jennifer Francis, Per Olson, and Catherine Shipper, and they developed the e-loading measure, which is used in a number of academic studies now. E-loading is a returns-based measure of earnings quality, if you will. How is it estimated? Well, in essence, you are running a regression using realized returns on a so-called factor-mimicking portfolio, and that factor-mimicking portfolio is developed and is constructed in a way that it describes a return spread in earnings quality, or that comes from earnings quality. And then e-loadings is the sensitivity of a given firm's returns to that factor mimicking portfolio. So in our main regressions, we run e-loading as a function of integrity, which is proxied by the number of uh, causation words, as well as all these other controls. The controls include uh, inherent business model characteristics so that they can capture the innate portion of earnings quality. And what that leaves us with is a potentially a discretionary component of earnings quality. And we're particularly interested in whether integrity affects that discretionary component of earnings quality. The bottom line takeaway from this study is that CEO integrity is associated with e-loading. So what does that mean? We measure CEO integrity as the number of causation words, and the number of causation words indicate excuses or low levels of integrity. Now that's positively associated with e-loading, and e-loading is the stock price sensitivity to low earnings quality. So if it's positively correlated, excuses with low earnings quality, we can say that integrity matters in predictable ways. That is that uh, low, earning, uh, low integrity is associated with low quality, high integrity is associated with high earnings quality. So what have we learned today in the webinar? Three things. Firstly, researchers are starting to measure, difficult to measure, traits about CEOs. For example, innate ability. Secondly, physical traits. 
Thirdly, cognitive biases. And fourthly, the innate preferences, such as integrity. Second main thing we've learned from the webinar is that researchers are starting to measure these traits using publicly available data. So whether CEOs like it or not, there are academic researchers that are starting to get impressions about things like CEO integrity. And the third and final thing is that these traits have been shown in recent studies to be associated with economic consequences. So for example, as I talked about in detail with the integrity study, CEO integrity appears to be associated with discretionary earnings quality. My name is Shane DeColey, and I thank you for joining me today at the first ever episode of Fuqua Faculty Conversations.